Uh, this is Casey J. Andrews, the designer of Viola's Room, which is uh, the latest production from the immersive theatre company Punch Drunk. Um, I saw the production last week and found it very effective. And just to give a sense of what I took from it. So I, I saw it as, in essence, uh, a coming of age tale, which starts off in a teenage girl's bedroom and then takes us into on a journey into the depths of her imagination. And the result is very surreal and dreamlike. So uh, Casey J, thank you very much for talking to me. Um, and and I'd love to hear a little bit about how you came up with the concept. No, Casey J is the designer, so I'd like to know how you came up with the concept for the project. Well, I mean, the original concept, this is actually the, it was one of the first things that Punch Drunk as, as a company made like 20 years ago. And so this is, this is a return to one of those first seeds of an idea that actually started the whole thing off. So I think that it's something that Felix, um, our director, had wanted to return to for a long time. So I came into the process and I, I didn't see the production that was put on 20 years ago, learned all about that and um, was introduced to the idea of using this, this story. Um, it's based on um, a Barry Payne uh, story called Moonslave, sort of gothic story. It's been rewritten by this brilliant, um, brilliant writer, Daisy Johnson, who's like a Booker, a Booker Prize nominated author. Um, so it's her adaptation of Barry Payne's original Moon Slave, uh, reinvented um, from Punch Drunk's original first ever production, um, which I think maybe it was a handful of people only ever saw. And it was one person at a time. And, um, and it just started in a theatre with a phone ringing. So that's... So that's this, happened, uh, this is one of the first things, because I know this Punch Drunk started off as a university project the whole company did so was this a university production or was this afterwards I actually I'm not the right person to answer that because okay. I, wasn't I wasn't there at the beginning um but I think it was yeah it was very early on so I, I think it was if it wasn't at university then it must have been must have been around the same era so yeah okay so what did you add to it then what did I add to it well I mean my my interest as a designer is um immersive narrative led installations um so i've done all sorts of things from large scale immersive projects to very small scale installations which are sort of storytelling installations shadow puppetry projection um and so i was kind of bringing my knowledge of both of those things together um to to have this intimate experience but on the have still have the same feeling of the the epic that um Punch Drunk productions so often have. I remember my first experience of seeing a Punch Drunk production. Um, I saw The Drowned Man um, mm -hmm. when I was at university. And um, and the first moment where I was just on my own in this forest and this huge orchestral soundscape, I just felt like I was inside this kind of, I felt like I was inside a film. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of capturing that epic um, feeling within this miniature intimate um, world where you're well you're only walking around with um, a maximum of six other people um, and so it does feel very very up close and personal um, and of course you've got um, you have headphones on so the whole thing is being narrated to you by Helena Bonham Carter and and it really does feel like you're being um, whispered a bedtime story so so yeah, it's it's the it's the intimate with the epic, I think. Yeah, and what are the challenges as a designer of combining the intimate and the epic? Gosh, I mean, it is quite challenging. There was a lot of there was a lot of um there was a lot of creative thinking we had to do to overcome different obstacles. I think probably probably it's um it's trying to to build that depth and scale and expansive quality that you do get in film um, or in life um, into a very small footprint. Um, although that you know you can't you snake through a whole labyrinth, the actual spaces that you're entering, largely most of them are quite small. And we wanted to lean into um, that closeness and it, at some points that claustrophobia. Um, of feeling the world closing in around you mm. um, it kind of begins I think that the the thing that was really helpful was at first feeling like uh, through the eye of the audience you're watching it 
um, as a sort of bird's eye view from the outside. Like you're hearing the story, you're seeing it almost like um, a spectator in a dream. And then the further you descend into the labyrinth, the the world starts to grow and swallow you up. Mm. Um, and so the design, I wanted the design to mirror that. Um, mm, yeah. Journey. Um, yeah, so that's what we tried to achieve and and hopefully we did. Um, but yeah, that was it was a I think that was the challenge to figure out what the arc, what the design arc is that's going to match in with the with all of the other the sound and the lighting and the and the audio. Mm, yes. And that claustrophobia, I know there is I mean, I don't want to give away too much, but there is one part where you literally feel like the walls are closing in on you like the like the space gets narrower and narrower until you think oh will I be able to breathe at the end of this <laughs> yes that's right yeah um yeah and that was um we we toyed around that was a big part of our R&D actually we were researching like you know what is possible what can we actually do what's going to there's you know the boring side of it what we are what are we allowed to do um how can we make it happen and how can we make it safe um but how can we still have that um element of the unknown and hopefully that's what we're that's what we got to with that particular moment um so yeah okay so I mean this is a piece which is very open to interpretation as I said and I I wonder how much I can I ask about your personal interpretation of what, yes, sure, yeah. what, what do you what do you read it as what do I well I've asked I kind of went on a journey with it from when I first started, from when I first read the origin of the source text to where we got to with the final production, even through um, now when different people I know are watching it and seeing it and hearing all their different interpretations. Um, the one that I've really uh, latched onto, the one that I really enjoy, um, because there's this kind of, kind of difficulty with like, you know, when we're, we're starting with a source text that is very um, archaic and, uh the the overall story is that there's a princess who's betrothed to be married and then she starts she kind of gets cold feet and at night time when there's a full moon she's running away she's running away every night to the forest to dance um and like a lot of um stories in a similar vein there's there's this the theme of madness and there's this theme of her kind of being trapped in and and it's and almost a suggestion that there's a darker force at play pulling her away but the kind of reverse uh, interpretation that I really enjoy as a kind of a modern lens on it is that actually this is a woman who went against the grain who is who is trapped in something that she doesn't want to be in and actually that running away which over you know centuries women have been you know, who go against the grain are interpreted as mad, they're witches, they're this, they're that. It's actually her escape. Um, and well, there's one, there's, I, I think there's one bit that I interpret there, but I really don't want to give it away. Um, but I'll, uh, yeah, there's one bit that I think is, it could be read as, read as very um, scary if you're reading it as the, um, you know, the, the actual source text, what it, what she actually comes face to face with at the end. Um, or there, a friend of mine saw it and they had an interpretation which for the ending moment was really liberating and empowering. Um, and so I think it's, I think one of the successes of this, of it is that you can have those different interpretations which completely transforms the experience and that um, end moment of where this kind of dream nightmare goes um yeah okay yeah yes okay and I wondered other aspects of the design that reflect that interpretation of yours I think that the I mean I think the, the thing that pulls it up towards us in the in the 21st century is that we do start in a, a teenage girl's bedroom in the 1990s which was something that um a lot of our team completely related to um mm. because we we're going oh well this was me in the 90s grew up. me too uh, I grew up in the 90s so yeah um and um so i think that's the thing that is because we're seeing it through the we're starting in her bedroom this teenage girl who um i view it as you know this is a story that she's invested in this is a story that she is 
she's reading, she's delving into this book, she's kind of fascinated or obsessed with this character, this theme of obsession keeps coming up. And so we can, I think it's really, I think it's really easy to understand a teenage, a teenager who has an obsession, whether that is a band or whether that is a book or whether that is a piece of music. Um, and so seeing it through her eyes and seeing it as if it was in her shoes, it's almost like this teenage girl who we never meet, we we kind of walk in step with her. Um, and so wondering how she might interpret it, actually, you know, the trying to escape, trying to rebel. Um, it might not necessarily be the madness which the 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 original text views it through. I mean, this is just my interpretation because, of course, the thing that's so beautiful about it is that you can interpret it different ways. And the original Gothic story is such a... Uh, I think it's such a classic in terms of the themes that it explores. It harks back to and links to so many other stories and fairy tales that are that we know so well um, that everyone will have a different read on it. Mm. Uh, but yeah, the the exciting thing was kind of seeing it through that teenage girl's lens and also imagining like what is her life. Um, I think she's quite an escapist. Uh, I think that she kind of can descend into her own. 1990s fantasies and so what are the parallels between her and the and the teenage girl of the story and actually I her, the... her own way of escaping her own form of yeah. escapism and the teenage girl of the story yeah 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 and I quite like seeing the yeah making sure that we are seeing the teenage girl from the the gothic novel as a teenage girl as much as we are a kind of trope in a gothic novel you know the woman in the white dress sort of running away like what is what is this person actually experiencing when she runs away why is she running away mm, yeah and I guess one challenge for you is to be able to balance your own interpretation against the the, the necessity of keeping it open to mm -hmm. other people's interpretation so you, I guess you don't want to put everything in that you might have done if it was for you by yourself you have to hold back to an extent is that right yeah, absolutely. I think, I, I again, I think that one of the huge successes of it, and one of the things that I love about seeing anything, whether it is, whether I'm seeing a piece of theatre or immersive work, or if it's poetry or music, but what really excites me is when I can watch something and it sparks my own connections in my own brain to whatever's going on with me that day. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what's so brilliant and beautiful about Punch Drunk's work, because it is so about your... Um, your experience and your interpretation of what is happening and what that sparks, what feelings that sparks for you and what narrative that builds for you. Uh, that's what I loved when I first saw the, the mask shows, you know, choosing who to follow and trying to having my own personal interpretation of whatever person, whatever performer that I was, was watching. I think it was trying to recreate that in this um, more linear structure that um, and, choice, yeah. freedom of choice yeah yeah the, the same feeling of that although you are you know you're going in one route there is a there's a there's a set path that you walk um but yeah and, and I'd certainly say that my interpretation has developed and evolved as we worked into it so um I loved being able to make discoveries as we went through and understand new things or find new ways of looking at things so that has completely evolved over over the course of building it, but then also over the course of the the time that it's been on and revisiting it and tweaking and um thinking about thinking about all these decisions we've made and re-watching it with new eyes after having been away for a few weeks, you know? Mm, okay, okay. Well, well, there are a couple of things I'd like to ask about, and I don't know if I if this is giving game away too much, but for myself, I'm very curious. Which is <laughs> the ballet shoes hanging from the tree. Mm -hmm. But what was that? <laughs> what was that about? Um, what was that? Well, we were, you know, there's um, there's a lot of, as I said, there's a lot of other texts that kind of thread through and into the, that link to the, the original text. Certainly a lot of people have picked up on the kind of references to the 12 dancing princesses, the red shoes. And although it's not based on those books, um, in the original text, in, in Barry Payne's original text, it talks so much about her going there and dancing and dancing. So we're imagining um, that this this gift she receives um, is this pair of ballet slippers. And we imagine that our, both our contemporary Viola and our um, story Viola 
uh, dance. And that is a form of escape. And so it's just taking that and expanding it and seeing that each time she goes back, she takes a new pair of slippers and they get wrecked and ruined. And um, and the the prince that she's betrothed to is, you know, showering gifts on her constantly, this kind of in a, in a way that becomes smothering to her, whether that whether he's really smothering or whether she just feels smothered by these gifts, whether that's like the actual quantity of gifts that she's given or whether it's an abstraction. And it's that's what we see at the end. Um, you know, what's the kind of whole story that's played out? I don't know if that's giving too much away. Mm, that's, um, I, that's, a, that's okay. It's just like, I was curious. I, I <laughs> like other people might be curious about it. And it's funny because it did make me think of the red shoes, but of course that is very, that's a very dark story and, and very uh, destructive and talk, and sort of about self-destruction. So, so I, I wondered whether there was an element of that in the story. And that also tied in with what I was about to ask you, which is that, that part in the chapel, you know, mm. where there's, <laughs> I can edit all of this out if it's giving you <laughs> way. But there's a part where where you go into a chapel and you listen to Mozart's Requiem. And uh, I, I wondered whether this was sort of tying in with themes of guilt or some something like that. Yes, yeah, certainly. We were thinking a lot about the um, we were thinking a lot about the different eyes that would be watching her, uh, and this this theme and this motif kind of crops up throughout in different ways. I think the chapel is probably the most clear, and it's a point where we've built to. So you know, you're 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 running through this story, you're walking in step with her, and as I say before, gradually it's building and growing around you until you know you're. It's not miniature and you're not looking from afar anymore. You're within it. Um, and so I think, yeah, the, the clearest kind of um, indication that she has this sense of being watched the whole time um, is probably in that moment there. And but I, I think on the on the other side of it, for me, sometimes the chapel does feel like a very it feels like um, a sort of safe haven, almost a a moment of of it's like a calm before the storm it's like this moment of of safety before um before we run towards the end um mm. having come from somewhere that is becoming again more and more intimidating more smothering quite um yeah quite daunting um period of of um the story before that so it it does also feel like this moment of of reflection and release which I suppose probably reflects what um what this um, I think it's I think it's interesting that that chapel can be both things and it's it's um there's a there's a reveal in the chapel which I think is I think it probably takes it from a place of solace to a place of um <laughs> an intimidating place in my view so there's this direct shift as you're sitting in there that um that completely changes the feeling of the room that you're in. Okay. Okay. Uh, last thing I'd kind of want to ask, uh, which is just a more general question is what do you, if anything, what do you hope that audiences might come away with? Obviously, yes, we, we want to leave, leave it open, open to them, um, open to interpretation, but in terms of a general feeling or a general flavor, what if someone said to you, I came away feeling like this, what would you want to hear? I kind of, for me, I think the, well, yeah, I kind of love that it's open. I love that different people enjoy different elements and aspects of it. And people have revisited because there's been times when they feel they've gone and they've really focused in on one part of the story and they wanted to go back and experience a different part. For me, the thing that I think is really exciting is like you're kind of, you're like falling into a it kind of feels like you're falling through the pages of this book that she's obsessed with mm -hmm. um and so I love it's like an elevation of a it's like an elevation of um someone kind of snuggled up in their bed at night and just like feverishly turning through pages it's like what would happen if we actually went inside what the experience is inside someone's brain at that moment so I, I quite like that like if if we kind of we lose the blurred line between when we're conscious and when that moment when we fall into the dream or the nightmare. So um, 
I suppose it's a, it's 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 escapism. It's um, it's Stop just being sucked, being, literally sucked yeah. into the story, into the pages. Yeah, of the yeah, being in a different world for a short amount of time and seeing how far we could take that and seeing how, um, yeah, how much people could descend through it with her as the character. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Casey Jane. It's, it's been really fascinating to talk to you about this. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more of the same, then feel free to hit subscribe on our channel or for more similar coverage, visit our website at www.thecuspmagazine.com. Thanks. And I'll see you another time.